Okay, so welcome to chapter three um, of anatomy and physiology. So today we'll be talking about the cell. Um, so if you remember last chapter, we finished off talking about our macromolecules. The macromolecules are our carbohydrates, our lipids, our proteins, and our nucleic acids. So remember we talked about lipids and one particular type of lipids are our phospholipids. And I said that our phospholipids are really important because they are the, what, they're the major component of our cell membrane. Okay? So our phospholipid is made up of the um, glycerol head um, with the phosphate tails. The head is going to be hydrophilic. Remember we said that hydrophilic um, refers to liking water. And then hydrophobic means that it does not like water. So it repels water. Okay. Okay, so this is what is um, the major component of our cell membrane. The cell membrane is really important because the cell membrane is what keeps all of the cell organelles or all of the intracellular structures actually within the cell. So if you think about um, what a cell membrane is, it is pretty much like the door to your house. Your door is what keeps you inside and intruders outside of your house. So that is why we have the um, phospholipid bilayer. So bilayer refers to two. So it is a structure made up of two layers of um, the um, phospholipids, okay? So this would be what it would look like. So we have the hydrophilic heads are this way and then the hydrophobic tails are facing this way. So the extracellular layer or the extracellular portion is everything that is outside of the cell. So if we're thinking about our home, the extracellular portion is going to be everything surrounding our house. So it's going to be our lawn. Um, if we live like in an apartment, it's gonna be like the parking complex. It's gonna be everything outside, our neighbor's homes, um, everything we that's outside. The intracellular portion is everything that's inside of your home. So all of your bedrooms, um, all of your furniture, you, everything that lives within the home is the intracellular space. Intra means within and then cellular. So intracellular, within the cell. Extra, when we're talking scientifically, refers to everything that is outside of. So extracellular, so outside of the cell, okay? So what is important about this bilayer is that it doesn't allow everything to get into it. The same way you don't allow just any old body to come into your house, the cell does not let any old thing or any old substance or, or person or whatnot um, get into the cell. That's very, very important. Okay, so you have to have, so that is called selective permeability. So it's selective in who is able to permeate or go through this bilayer to get inside of the cell, which would be over here. Okay, so selective permeability is very, very important in our um, cells. It's what helps keep our cells regulated, okay? So what, if we were to look at our um, study guide, the first question says, um, what is the function of the cell membrane? One of the functions is, is that the plasma membrane is selectively permeable, allowing for certain molecules to enter the cells while others cannot. Again, this is like your home. You do not let anybody into your home. You let certain people into your home, okay? Okay, so this is just another illustration of the cell membrane. So again, all of these little circles here are the, phos uh, are the hydrophobic heads, hydrophilic heads, excuse me. And these little lines right here, like these little tails are the hydrophobic tails, okay? And again, it's two layers, so it's a bilayer, okay? So what else do we see in the cell membrane? We see glycoprotein. Remember we said that anything that starts with the GLY 
CO or glyco refers to glucose. So this is a protein with a carbohydrate attached to it or glucose attached to it, right? This is a glycolipid. So this is a lipid or a fat with a carbohydrate or a sugar attached to it. These are channel proteins. Some things can go directly through the phospholipid bilayer with no problem. They don't need any help at all. But a lot of things that get into and out of our cell are going to use these channels, okay? So these channels act like a portal or like the doorway into the actual cell itself. Then we have cholesterols here. We have different proteins all types of good stuff. And they all mean different things. Every cell membrane is going to have your phospholipid bilayer, but not every cell membrane is going to have a glycoprotein on it or glycolipid or have cholesterols. Um, every cell will take all the accessories um, that it might need to allow it to um, be permeable, okay? So when we're talking about things getting through the um, bilayer, we have to talk about um, membrane transport, okay? So we either have passive transport or we have active transport. Passive transport refers to different types of transports that do not require ATP. Remember, ATP is what our cells use as currency. That is what our cells use as energy. So if something does not require ATP, that means it does not require energy. Okay, so uh, the most classic example of that is going to be our simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is when you have um, uh, molecules that just disperse themselves. So uh, an example that I can give you is if we were in a room together and let's say it's a decent sized room and I spray perfume near me, spray like 10 spritzes of perfume near me. If you're at the back of that room, eventually you'll smell that perfume as well because what particles want to do is they want to give themselves space. So if there is space, they're going to occupy that space. Um, another example of that is osmosis. So if you ever take um, water and you spill it on the counter, though it's going to spread itself out. It won't just be in that one little spot where you spilled it initially, it's going to spread itself out. So osmosis is an example of simple diffusion. It is just a diffusion of water. Okay, so simple diffusion is where molecules go from an area of high concentration. So they're really, really tightly packed, but they're like, you know what? I need my elbow, I need my room, I need my elbow space. So let me just go away and, and move away from the other particles. By moving away from the other particles, you're going to eventually, if it's something that you can smell, you'll eventually smell it. If it's something you can see, you'll eventually see it. Think about um, if you had colored chalk and you took it and you like threw it up in the air, eventually it would disperse all over the room or glitter. You have it in a contained bottle, you throw it up in the air outside of the bottle, it's going to go all over. That's an example of diffusion, okay? So it is when molecules move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So what that means is for our cells, if there is a ton of, let's say salt um, in the air, um, if we're talking about our cells. If there is a lot of salt concentration outside of the cell, it is going to move into the cell because it wants to get away from all of the other salt molecules, okay? And then again, osmosis is also an example of passive transport because it does not use ATP. So it does not require any energy. And an example of that is just going to be water. Water is going to, if it's spilled, it's going to spread as thinly as possible and it occupy as much space as possible. So these things do not require any energy, okay? Then we have things that do require um, energy. 
And those are going to be when we talk about our channel proteins. Those require some help. So they need energy because they're usually going against the concentration gradient. So usually if you're moving out from inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, you're gonna need some help because you're pushing past a bunch of people. So for example, remember when outside was open and life was normal and me back in my twenties and I would go, let's say to a club or to a lounge. The lounge would be really, really packed, right? So to get out or to go against um, a bunch of people, it takes some elbow room to really shimmy your way outside or past um, a bunch of people. Whereas it's way easier to just go with the flow. If we're all moving in one direction, it's super easy. But if I'm trying to go against the grain, I'm gonna need some help. I'm gonna need to put some, I'm gonna either need somebody to assist me to go against the grain, or I'm going to have to really put some muscle into going against the grain. And that is the same with, um, that is the same with, with channel proteins um, and active transport. So active transport just simply tells, simply tells you that you need energy to, to use that. An example of that is a sodium potassium pump, which we'll talk about when we're talking about muscle function. Um, skeletal muscle and as well as cardiac muscle requires a lot of help with, from the sodium potassium pump. So we'll talk about that. So it's um, how many, um, so what I want you to look up is the number of sodium ions that are moved outside of the cell and how many um, potassium ions are moved inside of the cell as well. So keep an eye out on that. Okay, let's talk about facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is also an example of our passive transport. It does not require any energy, but it does need some help with some carrier proteins. So the channel proteins are less selective than carrier proteins, and they um, usually mildly discriminate between the cargo size, cargo based on their size and their charge. So it's charge and size-based diffusion. So when we are talking about things moving inside and outside of the cell, the words that we use are um, for when we're talking about moving inside of the cell is called endocytosis. So endo refers to it's another way of saying within. Cyto, C-Y-T-O, refers to the cell. Okay, so this is the action of moving things within the cell, okay? So the main ones that we are going to talk about are phagocytosis, P-H-A-G-O-C-Y-T-O-S-I-S. -S. So that is cell eating. So our white blood cells are excellent phagocytes. So if there is a um, invader, in our, that our cells detect within our bodies, our blood cells detect within our bodies, it is going to eat that thing because it shouldn't be there. By eating it, it destroys it, okay? So when we refer to the cell eating anything or engulfing anything, we refer to it as phagocytosis, okay? Penocytosis is when the cell engulfs um, liquids. So that is like cell drinking. So think about having a glass of Pinot Grigio or Pinot Noir you are drinking. So Pinocytosis is cell drinking. And then we have receptor mediated endocytosis. That is when there is a receptor that is on the cell membrane and then a certain substance, which is a ligand will attach to it like so. And then the whole thing will then engulf and then become one with the, with the cell membrane until it becomes inside of the cell membrane as a coated vesicle, okay? So let's go back. So if the cell is engulfing a solid particle, we call that phagocytosis. The cell membrane en enwraps itself around the, the the particle and forms a vacuole around it. 
and now it is now within the cell within a vacuole. So a vacuole is kind of like a pocket, we'll say. So the cell membrane itself or the plasma membrane itself will form a pocket, engulf the solid particle, and then take it within the cell. And that is cell eating, which is also called phagocytosis. If there is a liquid particle or a liquid substance that the cell wants to bring within it, it's going to use the plasma membrane to engulf it into a vesicle. And a vesicle is a fluid filled pocket. Okay, so it forms a vesicle, which is a fluid filled pocket. Again, so if there is a liquid being taken into the cell, that is called pinocytosis. And then we have receptor mediated endocytosis. That is where there is a receptor and a ligand will bind that receptor and it's very specific. Not just the receptor is only going to react or respond to certain substances, okay? okay so a, that substance binds to the receptor, the plasma membrane then engulfs the whole thing forming a coated vesicle. Now, these are ways that things come into the cell. Sometimes the cell wants to get rid of things. So we do that via exocytosis. Remember we said endo referred to things coming in. Exo refers to things leaving, so exiting the cell, okay? So exocytosis is much like endocytosis, but in reverse, okay? So in this case, we have, um, so this space right here where my mouse is, is the extracellular fluid. Here is within the cell. So it is the intracellular portion. There is a vesicle here. So this vesicle has some uh, solution of some sort within it. It's going to then travel to the plasma membrane and then it is going to become one with the plasma membrane until it opens up and then it releases the um, substance, okay? The main takeaway here is that endocytosis is when things are coming into the cell and then exocytosis are when things are leaving the cell. The main things, the main types of endocytosis are phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and then receptor mediated um, endocytosis. Okay. I keep going here. Okay, so now let us talk about the cell. So this right here is an illustration of a prototypical human cell. Okay. So this right here is all of, it's a cell with all of the possible organelles that um, a cell may have. But keep in mind that cells are specialized depending upon what tissue they are a part of or organ system they are a part of. So they may not have all of these things here. What it will for sure have is always going to have, every cell will have these three components. It's going to have a cell membrane, so that is the outer portion of the cell. Remember that cell membrane is made up of the phospholipid bilayer. It is going to have a nucleus, which holds the genetic information. And it will always have a cytosol or cytoplasm, which is like the liquid portion of the cell, okay? Okay, so the cytosol is the liquid portion of the cytoplasmic compartment. And that is where all of our metabolic reactions occur. So we have so many different organelles here. And let's just quickly go through um, some of them. So let's see here. So let's start. We talked about the cell membrane. So that is what is selectively permeable. Only some things can come in, some things can go out it acts like the bodyguard of the cell. So if you don't belong here, you can't come in here, essentially, okay? It has the phospholipid bilayer, so that it's its, it's major component. Um, and then we have our nucleus. Our nucleus has all of our genetic information. In our case, that is going to be the home of the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. 
And DNA, its um, monomer would be a nucleoside, right? Okay, so let's move on to the mitochondria. The mitochondria is, um, I'm sure you've heard it back in high school or whenever else you had uh, anatomy or a cell biology class, is the mighty mitochondria. Why? Because all of the ATP that our body requires is made here, primarily made here. Some of it is also made in the cytoplasm, but the majority comes from the mitochondria. So the function of the mitochondria is that it is the site of energy production. Then if we move over here, we have lysosomes. So lysosomes are pretty much the garbage truck of the cell. So whenever the cell has worn out organelles, these, by the way, are all called organelles. All like the nucleus, mitochondria, all those are all called organelles. So if there is a worn out organelle or if the cell ate something via phagocytosis and it now has some debris, it's going to go into the lysosome. The lysosome has digestive enzymes to break down those debris and then it'll eventually be kicked out of the cell, okay? So the lysosome is like the garbage center of the cell. Then we have our endoplasmic reticulum. Our endoplasmic reticulum is the site of um, ribosomal production, okay? Ribosomes are important because that is a site of protein production. Peroxisomes are similar to lysosomes. They also break things down, but they also um, use peroxide to do so. So the same peroxide that we use to, um, to like disinfect if we have a wound is the same peroxide that we are able to produce um, to get rid of cellular debris, okay? So um, I want you to know, um, to keep track of the function of our um, organelles, okay? I didn't talk about the Golgi, but the Golgi is kind of like the, um, like the packaging center of the cell. It's like the, like the what do you call that place? Oh, I've been in my house too long. It is like the post office, excuse me, of the cell. So that is where proteins are sent to be organized, modified, packaged, and tagged, and sometimes sent out. Okay, so that is the Golgi apparatus. Let's see. Okay, so let's talk about the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is kind of like the... If we look at a cell, let's go back to our picture of the cell. If we look at the cell here, there, think of it as having a bunch of like tracks to help the organelles glide along because the mitochondria might be fixed, it might not be fixed. Lysosomes definitely are traveling. The vacuoles, which is just, um, which is just a pocket, is it might be here today, but it might end up over here today. Things are always moving. Nothing is really much static in the cell for the most part. So the cytoskeleton is how things actually get from point A to point B within the cell, the cell itself. And then there are three components of that. So we have microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments, okay? So just to go back a second, some of our cells actually move. And the ones that move either have cilia on the outside of the cell, so they're, they're little small hair-like projections on the outside of the cell, or they have a tail called a flagella, which allows them to move. So off the top of your head, what cell do you know that is motile and has one tail and that is sperm. So the sperm is a um, motile cell or a mobile cell that has a tail. The, the tail is the flagella and the flagella is what allows the sperm to meet the egg. 
Um, I don't see it here. Okay, there's no picture of it here, but it's okay. The other thing that we want to talk about is the cilia. So cilia is very, very important. Cilia is important, especially in our respiratory tract. So every time you have a cough, the cough reflex is due to the cilia have grabbed onto some mucus or to some debris, and you are coughing out all of the things that the cilia have caught. Cilia catch all of things that should not be in your respiratory tract, and they push them back up so that they that way they can be expelled. Okay, so cilia again, they live on the outside of the cell. They are attached to the cell membrane, and they are small hair-like projections. And the function is for them to sweep things away that come into contact with them. In our respiratory tract, they act as keeping our respiratory tract clean. And our cough reflex is due to something irritating the cilia or the cilia catching the debris. And then the reflex of our body is to cough it up, to expel it, to get out of our system. Again, our uh, the men among us have um, silly, not silly, they have um, flagellated um, cells, which are the sperm cells, which need to be motile, need to be mobile in order to meet the egg, to fertilize the egg to then create uh, eventually a child. Okay. okay, so let's go back and talk a little bit in depth about our nucleus. The nucleus is a big deal. Why? Because our genetic information stays there. Okay, so the nucleus is considered the control center of the cell. Okay, so it has all of the information that makes you, you, and makes me, me inside of there. Okay, every, if the deity that we have is the instructions manual for our body. So what that means for our cell is that even though all of our genetic information is housed in the nucleus, it does not mean that each cell is doing everything that the DNA has asked it to, because it wouldn't make sense for our skin cell to um, be producing, um, to tell those cells there to produce sperm. Does that make any sense? Every single um, collection of cells and tissues have their own specialized jobs and specialized tasks. So only certain parts of those genes are expressed there. DNA is in charge of gene expression and that is housed in the nucleus, okay? So if we were to describe what the nucleus is, It'd be like a computer. It has all the information, but you're not running every single application at once in every cell. Okay. So um, red blood cells are the only cell that do not have a nucleus. Red blood cells are the only cell that do not have a nucleus. They are also the cells with pretty short lifespans because they go through wear and tear. But Red blood cells are anucleated, okay? So my question for you is why are red blood cells anucleated, okay? That is the food for thought. So if we're going back to looking at the nucleus, so we see that the nucleus has something around it here called the nuclear envelope. So because the nucleus is so, so important and it has so much vital information, it has to have a second layer of protection. Because remember, the nucleus is already inside the cell. So it has the first set of bodyguards, which is the cellular membrane. Okay, so the cellular membrane is selectively permeable and it will not let just any old thing or any old body into the cell. Then you look and there's a nuclear membrane that is around the nucleus. It's like, oh my goodness, why? Because there's so many important things inside the nucleus. So just because you came into this cell and you have access to the cell does not mean you also have access to, let's say, the bedroom. Just because somebody comes over to your home 
does not mean that they can also come into your bedroom because it's a private area, right? It is the same thing with our nucleus. So the nucleus also has a nucleolus or a nuclear, excuse me, a nuclear membrane. And that nuclear membrane also is selectively permeable. So it has a different set of criteria as to who and what can move in and out of the nucleus itself. Okay. So let's see here. So the rest of the chapter goes through the steps of DNA replication. <clears throat> and we will, I, I'm going to rearrange that and put that in a separate chapter. We can talk about that separately. But let's keep going here. So we said that red blood cells are um, anucleated, so meaning that they lack a nucleus. Um, so yeah, so they reject the nucleus so that the way they can have enough space to actually carry oxygen. There's just no need for them to have any um, uh, extra space occupying things. So they're trying to be really efficient. So they get rid of the nucleus. That way they can carry um, as much oxygen as possible. That increases the oxygen carrying capacity. And then we have our um, muscle cells. Skeletal muscles are multinucleated. They have tons of nuclei. Because think about what a skeletal muscle is doing. It has to be constantly making additional protein fibers so that way it can pump and it can do all the things that it needs to do. It's um, highly functional. So they have uh, more than one nucleus as well as um, in a way cardiac uh, muscle fibers do too. Okay? So they are multinucleated. So our multinucleated cells are going to be our skeletal muscle cells. Our anucleated cells are going to be our red blood cells. Let's see here. And we'll keep going. Remember we talked about DNA and how it is deoxyribonucleic acid. It is a double helix. And its base pairs are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, okay? So adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. When we talk about RNA, let's keep going. RNA is a single stranded um, substance and it has adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil instead of thymine. Um, we will talk about the cell cycle quickly. So let's go here. When we talk about the cell cycle, we are talking about how cells replicate. Our cells are constantly replicating themselves, okay? So they are able to think about why, um, what, if there is some type of a crime committed that they can have, or if somebody goes missing, they have dogs sniff for the trail of the person. It's because what the dog is sniffing is actually not necessarily the actual scent of the person, it is the actual cells of the person that they left behind. So wherever you walk, wherever you go, you are leaving a trail of your DNA because our skin cells are constantly replicating and falling off and shedding off, right? So our cells have a cycle. The cell cycle under good and normal conditions is highly, highly regulated. Everything has a lifespan. You just can't go on and live forever or you can't just live for like a second and then die. Like our bodies are super, super regulated. And one of the ways it does that is through the cell cycle. So the cell cycle is a way of making sure that things stay in balance and different tissues have different lifespans. So their cell cycles are a little bit different. For example, our neurons, so the cells that are in our brain have a very different cell cycle and life cycle than our skin cells or our GI tract. 
our GI tract and our skin cells are constantly rapidly dividing because they go through so much wear and tear. Think about everything that we eat has to go down our um, digestive tract. And if we eat several times a day, that's a lot of work for our digestive tract. And then for our skin, our skin is constantly exposed to the elements, whether it's the hot, the heat, the, the sun, the, the wind, the rain, our clothes just causing friction, whatever chemicals we put onto our bodies, such as our lotions and our fragrances, and even the mechanical things that we do, we're like when we're exfoliating in the shower, all of that causes so much stress to our, um, our those parts. So there have to be constantly, um, there's, there are cell cycles a little bit shorter and it's constantly um, undergoing the cell cycle, okay? So, we have two major phases of the cell cycle. The major phases include um, mitosis. Mitosis is where the cell is actually replicating, okay? So if we talk about mitosis, mitosis has several portions, okay? So that is, there is interphase, prophase, metaphase, Anaphase and telophase. And if you're to look under the microscope while the cells are in different, while the nucleus is in different portions of the cell cycle of mitosis, it looks differently, right? So let us talk a little bit about it. So in interphase, what you'll see interphase is um, this, the cell can be at G1, which is growth one, G0, which is where the cells are not actively dividing yet. Then we have the S phase, which is the synthesis phase. That is the cells preparing to, to divide, but it's just getting ready. Nothing's like physically happening yet. Well, nothing is like visibly happening yet under the microscope, but we know that the cell is getting ready to, um, to divide. So it's preparing things. Um, G2 is the growth phase, and then we go back to mitosis. So this is just the cycle here, okay? When we talk about, um, let's go down, let's see what we have here. Yes, perfect, okay. So when we look at the actual, what it would look like under a microscope, this here, these fluorescent ones are what it would look like under electron microscopy or fluorescent microscopy. Okay, so in prose phase, what do we have going on? What we see are the chromosomes condensing and they're becoming visible. So I should go back. When we talk about chromosomes, chromosomes are the way that the DNA is um, expressing itself. So DNA, um, when it's highly condensed and visible under the microscope, we call it chromosomes, okay? If we were to break it down and in, in, um, into where it's less condensed, then we just have our double shift, then we cannot see that with a microscope or anything. Okay, but chromosomes are how we actually see it under the microscope. If we unwind it a little bit and it looks like squiggly lines, then we have chromatin. Okay, chromatin. So chromosome is where is that. What, that stereotypical like X that we see, <clears throat> that is a chromosome. The chromatin is where it starts to be unwound. And then the histones are like the individual proteins that make up the DNA itself. So going back. So during prophase, we have the chromosomes condensing and they become visible. The spindle fibers emerge from the chroma, um, from the centrosomes. The nuclear envelope breaks down, and then the centromeres move towards the opposite poles. In prometaphase, the chromosomes continue to condense, and the mitotic spindles um, attach to the to the um, opposite poles. In metaphase, we have the chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, which is at the middle. So at metaphase, the chromosomes line up in the middle. Then anaphase is where the centromeres start to split into two. And two sister chromatids, now called chromosomes, are pulled towards opposite poles. 
In telophase, the chromosomes arrive at the opposite poles and begin to condense. And then we have cytokinesis. Cyto refers to cell. Kinesis means movement. But what they're talking about is when the cells start to pinch and one cell now becomes two cells. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, so hematopoiesis, we will talk about a little bit later. We'll talk about that in the blood chapter, but hematopoiesis is the process of creating um, white and red blood cells. In biology, heme or H-E-M-E -E or H-E-M-A, hema, always refers to blood. And it's doesn't distinct it distinguish if it's red blood cells or red blood cells. But if you see heme, H-E-M-E, -E, or if you see H-E-M-A, that refers to blood. So if somebody said that they were going to um, a special doctor and that spe doctor specializes in hematology, you would automatically know that that doctor specializes in red, bloods, red blood cells or blood cells, excuse me. So that doctor specifically deals with blood disorders, okay, white and red, okay? So hema or heme, okay? Poesis in um, science refers to the generation of. So it refers to creation of. So the creation of blood cells. So hematopoiesis is a process that involves a differentiation of multipotent cells into blood and immune cells. Our immune cells are the white blood cells. Okay? But again, we will talk about that in further detail in that chapter, as well as stem cells and all of that good stuff. Okay, but I do, um, nope, that is it. So that ends chapter three. Um, please take a look at your, at your chapter three study guide in prep for the exam.